I am not here to debate with anyone. I have devoted all of my adult life to this subject. I only debate with my equals, all others I teach. But religion has always been a political thing to Europeans, and still is. And when it no longer serves them politically, they're going to discard it. Thing as race in the psyche of the world until the Europeans put it into the psyche of the world. The Africans knew nothing about race. On the subject of the origins and foundations of what we know today as Western civilization. One school of thought is that it is distinctly African or Afro-Asian in origin. The other, that Western civilization in large measure is the bequest of ancient Greece. Make no mistake, this is not a mere difference of opinion in the ivory tower. The battle itself has become an allegory for something as important as the debate itself. Academic insurgents have breached the ramparts of the acad academy's high priesthood, and the battle is as much for the authority to write history and for how to write history. Our task tonight is to ferret out the truth insofar as we can discern it, but more importantly, to question and challenge. And we have four incredible people with us tonight, and I'd like to introduce them to you and have them come to the stage as they're introduced. Already on stage is Professor John Henry Clark. Single point I wish to get across before we start anything. I am not here to debate with anyone. I have devoted all of my adult life to this subject. I only debate with my equals, all others I teach. This is part of a world war against the role of African people in the history of the world. If we began history, began mankind, how is it that the last branch of the human race to enter that arena marked civilization now think they brought civilization? Now, it is part of a war over and above Professor Lester Witts' book and over and above her political naivete. Her naivete is about what is happening in the Western world. We need to look at now is how Professor Lester Witts neglected the white writers through history, the radical European writers who wrote positively of Africa and who identified uh, the relationship of Africa to the ancient Greece. Now, if given time, and I probably won't be given it this evening, I can prove to you with your satisfaction, if you are listening, that Rome and Greece was not European creations. These were Mediterranean-inspired nations and couldn't be created by Europe because at the time there was no Europe. I came to this subject before I was 10 as a Baptist Sunday school teacher. I wanted to teach junior class in Sunday school, so I learned to read very early. What baffled me from the beginning was the Bible itself. I could not find my people in a book that's supposed to be about all mankind. And what called my attention to the neglect of Africa were the Sunday school lessons with all those white angels. And when they said, God is love, God is kind, God is no respect of kith or kin, I kept wondering, why didn't he let at least one or two little brown or black angels sneak into heaven? <laughs> so I began to suggest that somebody else had tampered with God's book in favor of somebody else, and that the Bible, to a great extent, was a rationale for European domination, but had been used as such. Then, coming to, you no, know, after leaving Georgia, after a white man that I worked for, if he's alive today, he has, uh, he's a liberal with a capital L, his name was Gag Steiner. I asked him about some books on the African people in ancient history. And in the language of the South, he let me down slow. I mean, he spoke kindly. He said, you know, John, I'm, I'm sorry that you came from a race that's made no history. But if you persevere, 
If you obey laws and study hard, you make history someday, and you personally might one day be a great Negro like Booker T. Washington. <laughs> Booker T. Washington was the one thing whites approved of at that time. All right, while doing chores at a local high school, holding the coat and the books of a recitalist, the book, I opened a book called The New Negro, and I found an essay by a Puerto Rican of African descent, Arthur Schumberg. The essay was called, The Negro Digs Up His Past. Now I knew I was not only older than slavery, I was older than my oppressor. And my oppressor was the last branch of the human race to enter that arena. Mock civilization. Don't get mad, get smart, prove me wrong. <laughs> You get to ask Professor Clark a question. <laughs> yeah. I hardly know where to begin. So I'm awaiting the question. Th that is my question. He, he, I can, I can Professor Clark has I stated that this is the first form of literary intelligence that surfaced around 1250, and in fact, it did not, uh, and I'm curious how he is maintaining that. All right. It is the first book, and it's a book of folklore, and we really don't know whether Homer wrote it or whether Homer was man or woman. It's the first book to become known, basic to the West, in a form that we could study and conjecture about, and it emerged at the time Europe was beginning to show some intellectual maturity. And if you deal with this, you have to deal with what, what Professor Lester accused me of, not paying attention to historical chronology. And if she read any of my texts, any of my numerous guides and curriculars and lecture notes, she know that I'm a specialist on chronology. I know that one comes first and two comes second. <laughs> but what, I'm, what I was trying to, to get across is that in the 8th century to the 12th century, so the intellectual emergence of Europe, at a time Egypt was in its 23rd dynasty and dying after nearly 10,000 years of some forms of organized society, Europe intellectually was just being born. And I further maintain that Europe in general had nothing to do with the creation of Rome and Greece, and yet the challenge of Rome and Greece created Europe because they were scattered tribes and the challenge of Rome and Greece brought them together and they became a people strong enough to create a state. If anybody got any information to the contrary, state the information to the contrary. I maintain that there was no Europe. You're giving Europe credit for things that happened before the first European war, shoe or lived in a house that had a window. <laughs> And I'm saying that you have not read, not just Massey, Joe Massey, and his, his European disciple, Alvin, I mean, Chuchwad, Signs and Symbols of Primordial Man, The Origins of, of Religions, and his extensive work on Freemasonry. You have not read the American disciple of, 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 of Massey, Alvin Boyd Kuhn, is who, who is this king of glory, one of the best written books on the Christ story when he proves that Europe, the basis of European spirituality was taken directly from Africa. Professor Rogers, would you like to follow on your question? I mean, no one is actually maintaining that uh, literary Greek culture pre-existed um, any number of Near Eastern cultures. Again, I, I find it a bit curious I don't that accept Egypt as Near East. I accept Egypt as part of, physically part of Africa, created even, by the Africans even, from the South. Even if, even if you... Even if, even if I concede or admit or agree with you that Egypt is part of Africa, what I'm about to say... There will be order. Thank you. There will be order. Thank you very much. Do I, do I detect some disagreement? <laughs> yeah. My, my point was going to be that the most recent scholarship about the genesis 
of the, those two oral epics, the Iliad and the Odyssey, points in fact in another direction to influence, and that is in fact the Hittite Empire, whose documents we can read very easily, and there may well be independent confirmation of the historicity of some form of a Trojan War in those documents. And so what I'm really asking is, why is it that we're just really looking in one direction when we're talking about the origins of Greek civilization? Professor Clark? Um, when Alexander entered Egypt, he wrote home to his mother and said that he at last reached the land where the Greek gods began, Apollo and Zeus. And he wanted to consult one of the great African teachers of oracles. And the oracle asked, how old is this man? He said, 32. They said, in 20 years, maybe he'll be wise enough to ask me a question that I care to answer. <laughs> Clark, uh, would you like to ask Professor Rogers a question? <laughs> All right, we, we are waiting. <laughs> Professor Clark? Yes. It is your turn to ask Professor Rogers a question. Uh, the main, my main concern is that they seem to have equated the civilizations of the Tigris and the Euphrates with the civilization of the Nile. What proof do you have that the civilization of the Tigris and the Euphrates predated the civilization of the Nile? I don't think that I said that, and I don't think that anyone maintains that. I think the, the Hittite Empire obviously comes at a much later period. I know very clear when the Hittite Empire came, I know what damage they did, because I maintain that every pe people who came into Africa, Greeks, everything from modern day English, everybody that came into Africa, did Africa more harm than good. Yes, and that Africa owes nothing to outsiders in regard to development, because all of them declared war on African culture, war on African civilization, war on African ways of life. They began to bastardize Africa and confuse and create a kind of historical schizophrenia that the Africans had even got rid of to this very day. They created whole words that did not previously exist, like Middle East. Middle from what? In round two. I think you have emphasized too much the word black, and we made the same mistake. Black tells you how you look, but it don't tell you who you are. The proper name of a people must always relate to land, history, and culture. I did not say Cleopatra was black. I quoted someone else who inferred that. My defense of Cleopatra is not on her blackness, but on the, no matter whatever she was, she was born in Africa. She defended, she was the her manipulation of Mark Anthony and Caesar kept the worst aspect of Roman rule from the backs of Africa. I defend her as an African nationalist. And that's a good, good defense. And no matter what she did with her wares in and out of bed, there's a whole lot of people got less for it. Professor Clark, do you think that we should always judge history in terms of race? <laughs> Look, there was no such thing as race in the psyche of the world until the Europeans put it into the psyche of the world. The Africans knew nothing about race and didn't think they belonged to anything called a race. And when the Africans saw the Europeans because they have a traditional hospitality to strangers, they didn't fight them, they didn't kill, they were curious about them. And when the African explorers, especially Mundo Park, went into Africa, he, nobody hurt him, no, me, nobody shot at him, nobody shot any arrows at him. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm afraid that you're not only a delinquent in African history, you're delinquent in African folklore. So much of our history is tied up with our folklore, but Europe has introduced words that didn't exist in anyone's vocabulary before. No one ever thought of anybody being inferior or superior. Intelligent people don't even, you, a human being can't be, you can't fall into that category. And nobody had the extensive problems the Europeans had with women because in the, in the period of feudalism in Europe that lasted over a thousand years, the white woman in Europe was a vassal. Right. But the African woman has never been a vassal in that sense. 
If we check into the, the culture unity of, of black Africa, dealing with the history of the matriarch, I mean, he's got all evidence right there that we were the first people to support a woman as head of state. We were the first people to support a woman as riding ahead of her army. We were the first people to make women a god. Oh, all right, all right. I just wanted Professor Lester to know some basic information about the concept of Afrocentricity. Uh, there's a lot of people who believe in the African awakening and discovering of their history and their culture who do not accept the word Afrocentricity because it's a compromise with the word African. It's either African centricity or it's nothing. And if she attacks Afrocentricity as the teacher of myth, have she attacked the nonsense about Columbus discovering America? <laughs> because he discovered absolutely nothing and he committed an act of genocide. He set in motion an act of genocide ten times worse than the act of genocide in Europe called the Holocaust, as though that was the only Holocaust in the world. That event in Europe was wrong. And even if only six people were killed, it was wrong. But it was a matter started in Europe by Europeans that should have been solved in Europe by Europeans. I will defend Professor Leskowitz's innocence because she is a pawn in somebody else's game. As I said in the beginning, it is beyond the lack and dislike of Afrocentricity, which has not even developed enough to be called a discipline. It is a world war to prepare the mind to accept the re-enslavement of Africa, to remove from the mind of all people anything good that the African has done, and to ignore the fact that Europe set up Africa to fall apart by imposing on Africa, to miseducated Africans, a nation state. The nation state is un-African. The African thrived at his best in the territorial state. Many cultures, many languages, side by side, challenging each other, fertilizing each other. What you might call an empire, if you study the last thousand years before slavery, the development of independent states in the Western Sudan, Ghana, Mali, Sungay, destroyed by the invasion from North Africa by the Arabs, the Arabs attacking the North African Muslims, attacking the African Muslims, and destroying the great university of St. Korea, exiling its greatest scholar, Ahmed Baba, who admonished his students believe in God and science. The Africans never separated God from science. The priest was scientist. The priest was the most knowledgeable person. That's why you had the concept of a priest God. Now if they wipe this out of the mind of our children and our children look at television and sound bites and think they were nothing but a nothing, when they re-enslave Africa, they're gonna say good for them. They're preparing us to accept it. They're preparing the world to accept the re-enslavement of African people all over the world. And I'm saying that Ms. Leskowitz is a pawn in their game in the tragic irony of it. She is the pawn in the game of people who turn their backs on her people and let them be killed by the millions. American intelligence, French intelligence, British intelligence, the intelligence of the Western world knew exactly what was happening to the Jews in Germany. We raised our voice against this in the old Harlem History Club, 1939 to the death of the, the leader in 1941. If you think that, oh, I mean, if we get into the nonsense about black anti-Semitism, blacks have always had a sentimental attachment to the Jews. They actually believe the Bible. You know we are the true believers. We out Pope the Pope, we out Muhammad Muhammad. But religion has always been a political thing to Europeans, and still is. And when it no longer serves them politically, they're going to discard it. They turned their backs and let this happen. Now they're creating a new game because Europe has spoiled Europe. They want to take some geography outside of Europe. They say the people they're going to take the geography from are unworthy. They can't rule themselves. Of course, they cannot rule themselves in artificial states set up by the Europeans. 
first place that Africa has to do is to just get rid of these borders. Re-establish the borders along the old lines and integrate Africans into Africa. Okay. Quite understand uh, the comment about um, the encyclopedia definition of Semitic, but I think I agree completely with Professor Clark that Semitic is not uh, a racial term. It is not a um, it is not a term even of culture. In principle, it should be a linguistic term, and not just Egypt alone. One of the main reasons the European can't leave it alone because he did not create it. Why would he come from Europe during the latter part of the Ice Age and create something in Egypt and go back and live under the Ice Age 2,000 years before he built a European shoe? <laughs> come on, make, let, let's, let's be real now. Let's be real. Why, would, why are they so generous to other people when they're not generous to themselves? 